Hey, Gene Ham here, and here's another uh, excerpt from my book, How to Get a Job in Animation and Keep It. I've been uh, talking about uh, how I worked in uh, in the union studios in, in Hollywood, and this is about uh, how to uh, how to work outside the studios. This is uh, called this chapter is called How to Keep a Job Once You Have It: Work Habits, the in-house freelancer. In 1988, I was going through another big change in my life. My mother had just died a year before, and I was missing her. At the same time, my freelance business had really taken off. Between commercials, music videos, medical films, industrials, and the occasional movie, I was working nonstop. One job would finish, and another would start. I was well past the point of needing to call around for jobs. Uh, my phone was ringing all the time. Then Dallas McKinnon swooped in, as he had in 1971, and announced that he was working on a new Gumby TV series up near San Francisco and that I should try out as an animator. In all the years I'd known him, Dallas had never told me that he was the original voice of Gumby. Freelancing is fun, but anytime you get a job offered uh, a movie or a TV job, uh, you usually drop everything and take the job. They last a lot longer than freelance jobs, pay more, and look great on your resume. The downside is that they take a long time, and you're out of the loop for freelancing jobs, and clients can forget all about you fast. Often, when a movie or TV series ends, you have to reestablish yourself in the freelance world again. As seems to be par for the course in my life, the trip up to San Francisco is almost farcical of misdirections, mishaps, and misunderstandings. The result was that I was half, still half asleep on Monday when I started at PrimaVision, where the Gumby TV series was filmed. The first shot I was assigned to was by Harry Walton, the animation director with a chicken flying through a window. Flying shots are the most difficult to pull off in stop motion animation. I thought they would start me off with a dialogue scene or a walk or ease me into the more difficult shots. Stop motion was really new to me. I was used to drawing animation, where if you needed to fly something through a window, you just drew it flying through a window. With drawings, you weren't hostage to gravity. With a stop-motion chicken, you needed to suspend it by wires and then ping each wire with your fingers before each snap of the sh camera shutter so the wires would blur, rendering them invisible, hopefully. Uh, since it was my first time animating a flying shot, it took me from Monday to Wednesday to finish the shot, and Harry Walton told me that I should have finished it in one day. By the end of the third day, I was worried that I might not have a job after getting rid of my rent-controlled apartment in Hollywood and moving up to the Bay Area. Since this was Wednesday, it was the day of the weekly game of volleyball after work. I was invited to play with the crew. The game was fun and everything was going well. I was in the front row close to the net. I was beginning to forget my worries when another animator and I both jumped to block an incoming ball. He came down with an elbow in my ribs. He landed on his feet and I just collapsed on the ground and didn't get up. I had never broken a bone before, but the sharp pain told me I had broken a rib. He apologized. I joked that I was glad he was on my side or he would have killed me. They drove me to the doctor who told me there was nothing to do with a broken rib but tape it up and try to keep it immobile. They just gave me some strong pain pills and told me to stay away from work for a month. That wasn't what I needed to hear. I decided no matter how much it hurt, I was going to go to the studio every day, though I wasn't getting paid. I wasn't fired, but since the Gumby job was non-union, they weren't required to pay me while I was on medical leave. I was going to plant myself with that pencil test system and practice animating until they thought I was good enough to get my job back. The pencil test system was, a well tra in a, was at a well-traveled corner of the hall where everyone could see me diligently working. One day, I overheard Art Clokey, the creator of Gumby, and another department head discussing a problem. The character Denali was a mastodon, and they were having trouble achieving effect, an effect of him spraying water from his trunk. Nobody had figured it out how to make it believable. I asked him if I could shoot a test. He gave me permission, and I borrowed a Denali puppet and drilled a hole in the end of his trunk to insert a wire. I remembered seeing a stop-motion film of Curious George 
where firemen were spraying water from their fire hoses. They used wire covered with plastic wrap. For each frame, they twisted the plastic wrap a little more to give it that spiral that water has when it shoots out of a confined space. The test was a success. I used a series of progressively longer wires to begin the stream of water and then twisted the plastic wrap on the last long wire. It looked like the massive amount of spraying water. Art Clokey loved it. That day I went from having no job to becoming the special effects animator for the studio. I constructed fires out of different colored gels, sheets of gel, uh, cut a bolt of lightning out of a sheet of chrome mylar. When angled toward the light, it reflected a lightning-shaped flash into the camera. And built a big explosion out of wire and pieces of cotton batting, spray-painted dark gray. When I wasn't working on special effects, I built characters and sets. The sound reader is the person who takes the sound that has been transferred to magnetic film and cranks it over a sound head on a synchronizer. The synchronizer has a meter on it that reads out frames. You listen for words and phonetically write them down on an exposure sheet on each line of the, of the sheet, and which each line of the sheet represents one frame. The sound reader gives these sheets to the animators to follow, so the animation comes out in sync with the soundtrack. One day, I overheard the sound reader tell the film editor that he had to quit because he was hired someplace else. Then he walked away, leaving the film editor wondering how she was going to find someone to replace him on short notice. She didn't have to worry for long. As soon as the sound reader walked away, I excused myself and told her that I could read soundtracks. I'd done it before on my own films. I inherited that job, too. I read three quarters of the soundtracks on Gumby Adventures. One day, they needed an extra voice for a scene. Dallas grabbed me and... Uh, told Art Clokey that I could do voices. After that one session in the recording studio, about once a week, I would be called out of the sound reading room to go record some voices. I specialized in villains and goofy characters. I was the Black Knight, the Monkey Man, Gumby's teacher, and an ant that was beaten up by Gumby. I never really took advantage of the opportunities offered when I was worked at Hanna-Barbera Studios. They were, there were animators who worked on on the floor above me, who had been working since the days of the golden age of animation. It wasn't until years after working there I realized who they were and how much they would have taught me if I had hung around with them on my breaks, lunch hours, and after work. I can't beat myself up too much for my ignorance back then. There weren't DVDs of all those classic cartoons with bonus features on who made them, and there wasn't the internet to research all the old animators. I made up for that lost opportunity by opening myself up to everything a Gumby job had to offer and everything I had to offer it. Whenever they needed something, I would say, I can do that. I call myself the in-house freelancer. Everyone else had to specialize and do the same thing every day. I did so many things I never got bored. Every day I woke up not knowing what the day would bring, but whatever it was, it would be new, challenging, and fun and I made myself indispensable in the process. Gumby was a non-union job. That was why I could do so many different jobs at the same studio, the Cartoonist Union, or the Cartoonist Guild, to protect animators pretty much limits you to one job category per project. What, uh, what work for you, what work you, uh, you do for that length of time, for what amount of pay is strictly defined, so you won't wind up being cheated. But Gumby was a unique project. Art Clokey was a wonderful man to work for. You were paid well, as much as you would have received through the union. The hours were good because Art didn't want to work past 6 p.m. He took us out to lunch once a month. Our creativity was encouraged. In a non-union job, you're out on your own. But if you keep your eyes open, every once in a while a job comes along where the people you work with are nice people and you feel good working on the project. 